Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to the last Telecast of 2020. This week, I chat with hugely experienced media consultant and former network executive, Jeff Ford. Gert's Lesis looks at the way that local broadcasters are standing their ground against the streaming invasion. Deadline's TV editor, Peter White, reflects on the most popular stories of the year and looks ahead to the biggest US TV shows in development in 2021. And career coach and wellbeing expert, Tracy Forsyth, walks us through her 12 wellbeing tips of Christmas at the end of an extraordinary year. It's all coming up on this week's telecast. Before we start this week's show, I wanted to say thanks very much for listening to Telecast this year. The show's now been downloaded over 10,000 times, and we've got listeners in 32 countries worldwide and counting. Thanks also to my guests this year. We've had some amazing contributors who've come on the show and shared their insights and opinions. We've got some big name guests coming on the show in January and some big plans for the next year. So please make sure you subscribe and share Telecast on social media. And also a quick reminder to sign up for Telecast Plus, our brand new newsletter containing my picks for stories of the week, interesting charts, rumors, execs for hire, and all sorts of other interesting TV industry stuff from around the web you may have missed this week. It's completely free. Just sign up at telecast-podcast.com. That's telecast-podcast.com. And it'll drop into your email inbox every Friday. You'll also find a link for it in the episode description. So sign up now and we'll see you in your inbox every Friday. So my first guest this week is Jeff Ford. Jeff's had a career in TV spanning four decades as an acquisitions executive. His roles in TV have included Director of Programs at Channel 5, Director of Acquisitions for Channel 4 and Film 4, Director of Content at Islands TV 3, and MD of the UK and SVP Content Development at Fox Networks Group. So, welcome to the show, media consultant and former network executive, Jeff Ford. How are you doing, Jeff? Hello, Justin. Uh, Not too bad, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Very strange world at the moment. I'm trying to live through it. That's all I'm trying to do. Like most people, just trying to live through it. We've nearly got to the end of 2020. You know, well done us for that. I think congratulations are in order. Get the champagne. Where's the champagne? Exactly. (laughs) How's your 2020 been then? Well, it's an interesting one um, because obviously I'm I'm probably luckier than a lot of uh, a lot of people who may well be listening is is that I actually don't work full time because I'm, I sort of retired a couple of years ago. But like like all those bad spy movies, um, I always I, I, I got brought back in. Uh, you never quite leave the organisation, do you? And um, this 2020, this year, I've actually been working on a couple of drama uh, projects. One one is sort of it's early days and uh, it, it's not really for for uh, sort of a, a conversation. But the other one is, and I've been working with um, a company called Aftershock, and they they actually are uh, 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 content owners. They have a lot of IP in uh, graphic novels. And what I've been doing in the last uh, this last year is actually speaking to a lot of broadcasters, uh, some talent, uh, independents, to sort of see if they're actually interested in taking on some of the the IP that we have in these, gra- these graphic novels and seeing if they want to sort of um, produce it. So it's it's been really interesting because a lot of people sort of don't look at graphic novels in the same way as they do normal novels, historical novels or whatever novels they are. It, it's a sort of, it's it's something they don't quite understand, uh, even though it's, you know, it's a written word and actually it's also, it's visual and it's like a storyboard. So all the elements of it actually are, are quite good for, for, for media people. We've got about three, I think we, you know, I've got to touch wood again when I'm telling you this, but three, about three people who, three independents who are really quite interested and very close, I think, to getting agreements with to develop uh, some of the IP. So it's been actually in, in a terrible, terrible year, it's actually been pretty good from on, on that front to actually take it from zero to 
you know, to, to, to somewhere better. And of course, lots of decorating is probably the other thing, and gardening. Yes. You know, yeah. like most people probably. Well, there's been an awful lot of development done, hasn't there, this year? Let's face it, particularly in uh, in the drama world. So it'll be interesting to see the result of that next year. And, well, I wish you all the best with that project. Interestingly, anime as well and graphic novels and that whole area is got a very, very strong genre fan base, hasn't it? It'll be interesting to see how that develops. And we've just seen Sony buy Crunchyroll only last week so it's a you know it's a fertile area it's a fertile um, area you're absolutely right i think the thing is one what, what we always try and say um you know at aftershock as, as you can tell i've, I've been swallowing the, the old uh, uh, their magic their magic potion is, <laughs> is that is that even if it's a graphic novel and you're absolutely right there's a lot of fans and but we mustn't think of it as being niche it's not actually it isn't niche um mm. it's actually quite broad look at you know I'm gonna, i'll do the old quotation of the walking dead what came from a graphic novel I think that you know the, the only about, there's only about seven thousand um, readers who uh, bought the magazine mm. uh, when before it went to TV, and I think after it went to TV, there's only about eight thousand uh, people who got the magazine. So it, it's about taking something that is a great idea and then adapting it for television or adapting it for film or uh, uh, any other platform. It's interesting how you've got to ensure that you, you know that the, the idea isn't small, but it, and it can be expanded into a bigger screen. Yeah, and a good story is a good story at the end of the day. And good story is a good story. Absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely right, yeah. Justin. So we've seen a whole load of changes, obviously, in the TV industry over the past 12 months. Um, some were changes that we saw coming and, and they've been really been put on steroids, but perhaps others we may not have predicted. Now, you've been in the industry for over four decades. How do you see this year for the content industry in the context of all the changes you've seen over the course of your career. Thank you for making me sound very old, four decades. I, it's, it's, lo- it's lovely to be welcomed on this show and, and shown up for being an old man. Um, so that's fine. But don't worry, Justin, everything is good. I'm all, I'm, I'm, I haven't turned you off yet. I think the pandemic hasn't helped in terms of, in terms of change anyway. And I think, you know, you can look at Look at the pandemic as as being a cultural and a, and a, and a sociological shift as well, uh, in terms of how how we look at work, how we in going to work, we don't go to work anymore. We we are at home working and we're on Zoom all the time and we don't go out and we want to watch television a lot more than we used to. But there are so many platforms to watch. So all these things have have actually changed culturally, but changed actually the way we we work and we work the things we watch. But it's funny how you say about uh, over the four decades, how it has changed. And I mean, uh, interesting, I think it's always has been change. I think it's probably the one constant that we've had probably, uh, probably certainly in the last 30 years. I mean, and I think sometimes you have to look at it as being change or or opportunity. And I think those can be, you know, good things. uh, And I think, and and, and I I think I've been quite lucky in my career and, and maybe just to sort of touch on a little bit on both those points. You know, I, I started in TV in in, about in 1977. You know, ITV, they said you know, ITV had a license to print money. It, it was only BBC One, BBC Two and ITV. And ITV wasn't even called ITV One. Uh, you know, it was on Channel Three if you turned your dial and all that sort of thing. And I had a job at the, at the BBC in Windmill Road. And Windmill Road doesn't exist anymore. It's now a block of, I think it's it's flats, very nice flats as well, looking over Brentford. Um, but then, you know, 1982, you had Channel 4 came along. And that's, I mean, it was a huge, a huge change and a huge shift in terms of what television was and what people could see and what the what the, the offering was. And, um, and and I was I was trying to get a job in the acquired department at the BBC. In that time, in the early 80s, were quite old fashioned. In terms of employment, I'd never been to university, and uh, and and basically it was because I think you know the old school tie, and I wasn't quite the right person, and they, they didn't think I was the right person for that particular job. I couldn't sort of escape my role at the BBC that I had in, in my parent department, and so therefore that whole thing of like social mobility or that whole thing didn't sort of really really exist. And I'm not saying you know poor me or anything, but it was. I had a little bit of sort of experience of, of what that what that actually meant at the BBC. And it seemed to me that, you know, I, I had to almost escape the BBC, I think, to sort of to see and try and, and try and grow my, my career. And 
And in, in sort of 1988, I, I got a job at Anglia Television. I, yes, I moved my family to Norwich because somebody retired. So, you know, that, that was a, a bit of luck, really, for me. Not so much for him, but it's good luck for me. The, the following year, all of a sudden, satellite television launches. So how, what a shift, what a change that there, there was there where Sky and, uh, you know, BSB that were, that were there, they, they, and how it changed the landscape explosion of channels you know you've got then you know you've got cable you've got the, the flex text the more, more opportunities for indies the distribution world sort of saw dollar signs pound signs then we went to yorkshire television in 1989 when the, the chap who was doing my job passed away i started to be in in places i was very very lucky and managed to sort of find those opportunities where there was a change was happening in 1992 i know this sounds like a you know a history lesson but you know try and stay awake at the back the ITV franchises all got thrown up in the air and Thames Television lost their franchise. Probably one of the most influential producers of television programs uh, or of a company, a broadcaster, they were just kicked to one side and Carlton came on and took over. You know, there was that whole worry about how would Carlton do? And actually, I got a job at Carlton because the chap who lost his job at Thames and therefore I had the opportunity at, at Carlton and the network centre was created. And... Um, that was another, again, a whole raft of jobs, a whole raft of opportunities for, for people. And it, mm. it seemed at that particular time where everything then seemed to be growing. Everything seemed to be moving outwards, uh, A, from, from a personal level where I was sort of doing all right. But also there, there seemed to be far more opportunities than there had been in the past when you had just, in, you know, 1977, there was only BBC and ITV. And now you've got this plethora of channels and you've got all these things going on. And it was a very exciting time. Once that sort of that franchise round sort of happened, then you had the, the whole thing of ITV companies merging. And therefore, all of a sudden it started, everybody was saying, oh, we need to now to save money because there's more pressure, there's more competition. Viewing is fragmenting and we need to be able to, to save our money. And all of a sudden you started seeing this merging of companies, the swallowing of franchises, this whole thing about savings started to really influence the, the market. But then all amongst this sort of 1997 Channel 5 then came along. New opportunity. You know, I chased Dawn Airy all over Cannes to get a job there uh, at Channel 5, which and uh, I finally caught up with her. Uh, she didn't run very fast. So, again, more opportunity for everybody. R- really interesting that was. I got, I, tell you, I got another job then at Channel 4 uh, with Kevin Ligo. At that particular time, you're sort of having changes of rights and who owns those rights. Broadcasters always used to own rights almost forever in perpetuity and now indies are sort of saying no 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 hang on a minute we've produced these shows we want we want these rights so the whole thing about that relationship between broadcaster and independent then started to change and then broadcasters wanted to create their own content and own their own content then the whole thing about buying indies as well that started to sort of think about and then they've got the, the whole change in viewing and rights with pay you know pay-per-view and and vod and then digital channels and then catch-up I remember when I was at Channel 4 doing the first catch-up deal for the major required show, which was Desperate Housewives. And it was like groundbreaking. You know, nobody ever done it before. Oh, my God, you know, is this the end of the world? Well, obviously it wasn't. But on top of that, it was all about, well, how can you see these shows? You're going to have catch-up. You don't just want them to be seen on the big screen. You've got to see them on the, the second screen and on the smartphones and all other platforms. All this, this sort of magical world that didn't exist began to exist then as this fragmenting is happening fragmentation is happening you've got more viewing figures being under pressure and then in 2009 where I, I sort of returned to channel five and that's when i became director of programs under under richard desmond and they've got you know the svod the ott platforms the youtube netflix all making their own inroads into uh, the up their opportunities and into into people's homes into into the into viewing but it doesn't sort of stop there it, even when i went went to ireland in to work at TV3 in 2013, and it was, I was um, director of content there, UTV Island started. So even when I thought, okay, well, I might get five minutes rest, or, you know, as, as the world continues to change, uh, UTV Island launched, and what they did was they bought all the ITV content. And, and therefore, so we had TV3 not having any of the ITV content anymore, and UTV Island having all of it. And so even in this little island of Ireland, 
there was an, it was an absolute horror and an absolute war about would TV3 survive with this UTV Island coming down from the north into the south. Well, of course, you know, it did. And actually UTV Island went bust in the end and, and sort of, you know, the status quo sort of came back. But that was an, an, an unbelievable shift in a, in, a, in a small island where there was hardly any money and they'd just gone through the, the, the had the Celtic Tiger and then you had all the sort of the, the stock markets fall and all that was influencing in, in the background. And so it continues. And then, I, and then I went to Fox in 2015 and, and, and then you've got Disney buying Fox and then you've got uh, Universal buying Sky. Um, and then I thought, oh, sorry, I'm retiring. I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> you've certainly been there and experienced, as you say, you've experienced change all the way through your career. So I guess, you know, in the context of that, 2020 has is, is not been that much change going, going on, has there? It still continues, and I think that the whole thing of you're seeing the yeah, the whole distribution end ch- changing, where there's this this whole thing of ownership of content. People like Warner's and Disney and Universal are having their own platforms, and because at the end of the day, they've got to try and beat Netflix. And I I remember being in a, a meeting, and I'm not going to say where it was, but I was in a meeting, and it was all about who's going to be the last platform standing almost kill or be killed. And there is this whole sort of attitude of you've actually now got to survive and how can you survive? And I think this is the thing about, and it's actually maybe it's a metaphor for 2020 on the whole of actually survival and the survival of the fittest. I mean, the great thing about it, you know, there is fantastic content out there if you can find it and I, that's a that's i think that's a that's always a problem and it has been a problem i think well that's another thing isn't it aggregation and, and we, we touched on that last week but that's, that's probably something for a for another show but yeah absolutely there's more great content out there than ever before and and as you say we've entered into a phase of survival of the fittest although you say there's a lot of great content out there there's also because there's a lot of you know a lot of content there's a lot of content there's a lot of also content that isn't very good. Having an editorial view, I think, for brands, channels, platforms, or whatever, is so key. You'll be able to to guide people to those shows and to the shows they want. My only issue, I think, is and a negative, I suppose, is the concern of you know we all hear about the algorithm and this is you know this is what you might want to watch and all that sort of stuff. And I think it's it is useful. I mean, you know, all all tools are useful because if you know if if it says you know you liked. Toast of London, for instance, you're going to like X, Y, and Z, and that's great. But I think the trouble is, of course, is that it doesn't tell you what you might want to like. Even when I was at five, when we were doing, when we were commissioning, you know, you can say, "Bring me this," but you don't want people to bring you that. You want to bring you something like it, but round the edges. That you want to be surprised. You want to be intrigued. You don't want to have exactly what you want because if you have exactly what you want, it's a very narrow thing. You have to be very careful about, about those sort of things, I think. When you are asking for those shows, you do leave yourself room to expand. It may be about just cutting the edges off where you don't, you certainly don't want stuff, but do not be too sort of prescriptive on, on absolutely what you do want. Over the course of your career, I mean, you've been in content acquisition leadership roles, as you touched on, for ITV, Channel 5, Channel 4, TV3 Island, Fox Networks. Hmm. Looking at them now and this survival of the fittest approach, how prepared do you think those channels are for the next five years? Well, I think if you're talking about acquisitions, I think some are better placed than others because some have a different reliance on acquisitions than others. But it's all about the studios also and their strategy about what they're going to allow people to have. Uh, And I think that's an interesting one. And, And of course, is how much broadcasters may will be prepared or platforms will be prepared to buy that content if it is available. You know, there was a time and, you know, it's that time still actually is still, it's probably still now, is where acquisitions can cost an absolute fortune and can cost as much as a commission or, or more. Acquired shows always used to be the, uh, used to be the ones that you could, you could buy and they would help fund your commissions it sort of changed and there was a whole time where acquisitions, you know, were some figures to, to buy per episode. That I think has, that pro- has probably has gone a long, long time ago, but they are still, still expensive because the competition is so 
is so rife. But it's all about what those studios are doing and what they're going to allow, I think, in the future for those those uh, platforms to have. But of course, you divide it down into, is it theatricals, do you mean? Do you mean uh, series? I think we're still seeing what studios are going to do on the acquisition front. They're not, acquisitions aren't as important as they used to be. But if you're running a movie channel, for instance, it certainly is. Um, you know, so Sky, I'm sure, are looking at what everybody else is doing. And that's why they want to bring in things like Disney Plus into their sort of, uh, into on Sky Q or whatever it'll be to ensure that they have got those supplies. Because, you know, supply is, is very important when you're running a, a business that is reliant totally on, on acquisitions. So we've seen lots of networks around the world pivoting to digital over the last couple of months. Many senior execs have exited and these businesses are really looking to embrace this new digital world. You know, some may say, you know, a bit late, but anyway, but you've got these huge networks looking to digital and the role of channel commissioner now seems to be endangered. What do you think that means for the type of program that's going to get commissioned over the next few years? It's an interesting one, this. I think it, it really comes to, in, into focus, I think, when you sort of look at what the BBC are probably planning to do. Their change of emphasis, isn't it, really, to sort of it's, – it's, it's to fit their content into their broader digital plans more than sort of looking at, 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 at channels individually. And, and uh, I mean, I think you've got to say – it's right, but I think, but 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 I think all or most big ships, I think, need captains, and uh, and I know when they sort of say we're well, going to get rid of, you know, the the controllers of these channels, it's, it's one of those things. Is it's timing, and it, and is it a little bit previous? I, I think genre heads, uh, which is where sort of what seems to be taking over at the Beeb, because I've obviously worked with a lot of genre heads. I always think they want to commission their shows. I think that that whole double tick thing, which we always used to have at, at five. It's, it's very useful to have because if you're, if you're just doing a one tick process and you're saying, oh, I like this show, I'm going to I'm going to get this show without sort of running it past somebody's sort of slightly more independent of thought, I think is, is a sort of slightly dangerous thing. And I, I know they're going to have, what was it, portfolio editors, I think. And, and hopefully that will be that almost a double tick. I worry that without having that, that sort of questioning is a concern. I, that's my that's my only thing. I think it's the right. Certainly, it's the right strategy. But don't forget also the, the BBC One and, and BBC Two, Bit Four, and, and all the channels that are, this is affecting still have lots of viewers who do want to watch linear linear shows. And I think that's also a very very important thing. And you mustn't you know don't kick baby, don't throw baby out with the bathwater. Again, I've got a, I've got an old fashioned view because I am sixty. Well, actually, I'm 61, but I, I tell everyone I'm 60. Well, you're probably the ideal, you know, age for a BBC One viewer, aren't you? Well, I am, although, I, and I do wear a dress on the odd occasion. <laughs> so, um, so I'm more sort of ITV uh, 55 plus older female. Uh, right. Like yeah, me and Grayson and Perry, or Grayson and Perry and I, should I say? But I think that's the whole thing. I think I think it's, it's I think they're absolutely right. But I, I worry about the captain of the ship, and I think that you do have to have somebody who sometimes makes those decisions. And as long as that sort of reference is, is in place, I think it's fine. I've worked with people who would just go, "Oh, we'll commission all of these stuff because I think they're great." And then you have to worry about the finance of it and that sort of thing. So there's always going to have to be a decision about what's the higher priority on your list. If of the ten things you really want to get, that you only can only commission five. Or does it does it come down to financials? I mean, it's it's a it's a question of that, and I think that's uh, it's. So I don't think I probably know enough about what the BBC's plans are and how people will do this. But it, I think it's right. But I think it has to be very, very, very carefully done. I think, um, and to ensure that viewers or customers or consumers uh, actually don't get a bum deal. Now, before we move on from networks and channels, I just wanted to ask you about Channel Five. And your time at Channel 5, yes. you were working for Richard Desmond. I was. Anybody that's had Richard Desmond as a boss has probably got a lot of stories. What was he like to work with? Well, actually, it's, it's a strange one because I was going to say most of my after-dinner speaking is uh, regarding this particular point, but I don't do any after-dinner speaking at all. <laughs> but if I did, it, it would, that's what I'd be employed, employed to do. But no, actually, I, I, I'm, it's a strange one because people always are thinking, here we go rubbing their hands together. This is a, we're going to hear some juicy gossip. But the thing about Richard, 
is he was he was actually quite easy in the end to work with and work for because Richard knew what he wanted and he actually liked television. He was one of these people who actually did watch TV. So he wasn't just talking about things that he didn't get or he wasn't a viewer. He was a viewer and he actually therefore thought, oh, you know, I like that program. I like this program. So when you sort of, you know, when Big Brother has the opportunity to come on, he goes, I know about that show. I want to get it. Let's, why don't, why don't we try and get it? Let, let's do it. I, look, looking back, I actually look back with, with quite a lot of warmth of that particular time. I think also you've got to, I've got to say that he gave me probably the biggest job I, I ever had, which was, you know, director of programs at Channel 5. And I'll be eternally grateful for him giving me that opportunity. And to also, at that particular time, where the channel had been going, you know, steadily downhill because of just the, the, the way it was and, the, you know, the sales market and all that sort of stuff. And it was really poor. And I, I think we were really, I, I gave me an opportunity to actually almost, I won't say resurrect because that's a bit too theatrical and a bit too much, but an opportunity to steady that, steady the ship and point it in the right direction. So we were actually going up as opposed to going down. You know, if I was in a pub and Richard turned up, I would actually say I'd be actually quite happy to say hello and welcoming in and that sort of thing. If you could obviously go to a pub, obviously, well, obviously I can't do because I'm in tier three now. I'm not going to get one of these boardroom stories, am I, out of you, Jeff? No. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Well, I, I that is over a Scotch egg. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. You know, looking at the production side, if you sort of took off your commissioner hat and put on a producer hat, and if you were a producer today in light of all of these changes that are happening uh, what would be your strategy to sell your shows in today's industry i think you've already touched on something which is always the best thing it is look it's it's about good ideas uh, it's it's about fresh ideas it's about new ideas it's also about knowing what you know knowing what platform that you should be talking to about your ideas platforms you know, aren't, aren't, aren't really as important or supposedly as important, but I think they still have a, a, a position. At the end of the day, having that, that editorial voice, people can understand editorial voices and they have their favorite brands and they have their favorite brands. If it's a shoe or it's whatever it is, they know what they, they know what that, that thing offers. So I think whenever you're having a, uh, whenever you want to, when you're ever, you know, trying to sell a show, or put, uh, I think is you, you do need to know where it's going to go. I, I don't think there's anything particularly new in this at all. I think you have to be sort of flexible. You know, it's difficult with money these days. Um, it's always difficult with money any, any any day, I think, really. I'm a commercial, always was a commercial beast. Uh, uh, even, at, even when I was at Channel 4, I always tried to be. And I think part of the thing that's an important strategy you must have, I think really, if you want something that's going to go on forever, is something that's returnable. I think people really like having that returnable show. Character-led, it may have obviously character-led in a drama is easy, but also character-led factually, in terms of factual or factual entertainment. I think people want something they can attach to. Again, this is not brain surgery, and luckily for me and, and people if I favor my patients, it isn't brain surgery. It's a really lovely thing to be in. It's a really fun environment. What are the best tips you've got for a pitch, for a producer coming into a commissioner for a pitch? Give me your do's and don'ts for uh, the right way and the wrong way to pitch. When you're going for a pitch, I think you need to be, uh, you, need to, you need to know who you're speaking to. That's back to this brand thing. You need to know who that channel is, what they stand for, what their audiences are, what they're looking for. So understand all those elements before you get in. Uh, you only need to have three or four good pitches you don't want to have you know say oh that one doesn't work okay i've got another one and then you're there for two hours going through all these these ideas so it's all about ensuring that you have a very tight pitch you can and, and you want to generate excitement you don't want to be leaving it you know dull you don't want to be dragging the meeting at all it's really common sense half of this stuff mm. you know like anything you want to go you want to you want to be prepped for it you want to know who they are you want to know what they like you want to know what they've commissioned and and, and what they're looking for simple straightforward hasn't changed and still to be perfectly honest people don't do it they still get it wrong and i you know when i was at, even in my last job at fox which is only a few years ago people would come in and just clamber on all this stuff and you just think this has got nothing to do with this channel at all. You think, have you actually, you actually say, well, have you watched Fox? Do your homework, basically. 
know and know your subject, know who you're speaking to, and try and relate it to things that they're doing. And be also be prepared to not have too many ideas there, but to say, right, we'll take some of these learnings back and we'll come back to you in a little while with some more ideas if we if we find them appropriate, or supporting stuff, the stuff that we've given you. Now, if you were starting out in the industry afresh today, um, yes. who would you want to work for and why? Well, I think anybody would have me these days, I think. <laughs> um, there are so many places to go. But in some instances, I think these days, you almost have to rely slightly on yourself a bit more than you had in the past. Because I think, you know, there are so many one-man bands. There are so many things that you can do. You know, the training you used to get at the Beeb, for instance, um, years ago, I think doesn't probably exist as much as it did, or it's it, it just in a, it's in a, it's in a different way. Again, it depends where you want to be in your career. Are you going more digital? Do you want to go into production? You know, or the even in the IT we up department for a broadcast or a platform. There are lots of opportunities, but you need to know what you want to do. But I think you have to rely on yourself hmm. far more now than you'd have ever done, just because there's loads more companies, but sometimes there's not so many people about in those companies. I didn't get an answer there, Jeff. Who would you like to most work for? Who would I like to work for now? And the trouble is I'm, I'm, I'm knowing what I know now. So I'd probably say ITV. Okay. Look, a, I'm a traditionalist, so and, you know, and I'm, I'm come through all these things, and, and I know what ITV is about, and I know it's, all its brand values. But I also I know Kevin Ligo. I loved working for him at Channel 5, and I love working for him at Channel 4. And he's he's just he's a he is also a person who who just you love him. You can't help but feel a great affection for for Kevin if you work for him. He and uh, I think he's actually probably got more followers than Jesus. I mean, I think so. He's one of those sort of people who <laughs> absolutely it, you really do love Kevin, and you'd go to the ends of the earth to try and to to, to work for him. But in terms of that's a sort of almost like oh, I just want to work for ITV, you know, with Kevin. But in terms of how I do it. And how I would get into ITV, I think this would be a really interesting question. And, and I probably don't know the answer to that because I think it's a really tough to know what you want to do and how to down how to do it. And that's why almost you have to rely, I think, on yourself to give yourself the training, the strength, and know what you want to do. The other thing, of course, is that you know, if you can find have a, a mentor when you get do get into these places, you know, mentoring schemes are also quite important, I think, in, in, in broadcasters. And people being able to give people time, when I was certainly, you know, it, actually throughout a lot of my time, is if anybody what said, look, can I come and see you for half an hour and have a chat about stuff? I would always be willing to have a conversation with anybody. People did it when I was first started. People did it with me. And I think you have to say, I have to give that time up. You have to just sort of say, oh, we're all busy, I know, but do you know what? These are people and you want to help them and they'll remember what you did for them and they will do it for other people as well. And I think so mentoring, I think, is, is a, it doesn't, again, doesn't really answer your question. I sort of have it in a, sense, in a way. But I think that it's a different way of how we need to train ourselves and be prepared in certain jobs. And I, I always uh, am so thankful for those people who looked after me and hopefully uh, the people who I've given time to, I've given them something to, to, to help with their careers. So now it's time for Story of the Week, where my guests get to highlight the TV industry news that's caught their eye in the past seven days. Jeff, what's your Story of the Week? The story about Warner Brothers and um, moving all their uh, next year's, all their theatrical releases uh, onto their HBO Max platform um, on the same day that their movies will hit theatres. And uh, I, I, I think it's a sort of it's it's a sort of a groundbreaking or ground shifting or ground moving event. Um, I mean, I know Christopher Nolan's said something about this and sort of you know his films are made for the big screen and it's disgraceful that they the, that Warner Brothers have have, have 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 made this decision. It's all about their business model, uh, and it's all about back to that almost that last man standing. Warner's, I think, are, are in a, it's an interesting place because. They are a superpower in terms of their movies, but they're not in comparison with somebody like Disney. Disney Plus, you know, has gone through the roof, and I mean, they, you know, they've got millions of and millions of subscribers. They're playing with this sort of this tactic 
of, of dropping movies here and there. And I think they, the, I think the next Pixar is going to be a, a, a Disney Plus only release. And there's some they're going to share with theatrical and Disney Plus. Uh, I think that's because they are in a different place. I, I think in a, in a different place to, to Warner's. But what it does, as I say, it shifts the earth and of that whole thing of theatrical windows, that whole thing of people going to the cinema, that which I do worry about. Because the only thing is, it's, it's again, that part of our behaviour and part of our culture. I know it's a modern culture and it's only been going for 100 years or so or 120 years. But it is it is part of how, how we view film, um, which is only 120 years old. And not to be able to go to the cinema and see films in the, in the big screen, I think, is a, is a, would, would be a bad thing. Now, it's not going to end, you know, the, the world of the, this world is not going to end in three years' time. But it's a big change. It is a business play of it trying to be that the biggest, the best, and to kill the opposition off. And the only way they can do it is have this have this platform on HBO Max because they need to have more viewers onto that platform. And therefore, they think this is the best way to do it. I mean, just funny, at the moment, of course, you've got uh, Amazon and Netflix who use um, theatres as marketing tools because they've got so many of these big movies that they're doing or big star vehicles uh, they want people to come to the theatre so they can actually see the film, understand what Netflix and Amazon's all about, and therefore sign up. Everybody's using it for slightly different motives at the moment. It, it would be very disappointing if if theatres end. I, I really wouldn't like that to happen, but I don't think it's going to happen now or for a long, long time. But it's but it's a, it is that sort of thin end of the thin end of the wedge, yeah. and uh, and I would hate to see cinemas go the way of so many other things like the dodo yeah well they, they've actually said there's 17 films affected uh for 2021 starting with uh wonder woman 1984 this christmas and they've said that you know they may review it in future but obviously there's a whole load of opposition out there from the directors guild of america christopher nolan you mentioned joe dapatow aaron sorkin I mean, the whole of the industry and agents and talent, obviously, because they get recompensed on the back end of the success of, of films in theatres. And obviously, we know streamers don't really share their performance statistics with, uh, with anybody. They, obviously, the question here is, what's the value of a film to talent and to the industry? And obviously, we also know that theatrical chains like AMC are, are in real trouble. And I think they've only gotten cash reserves until the end of January, it's been reported as well. It's certainly an interesting time to be in that side of the business. Let's see how that plays out over the next few months. You know, it's about about points that the, that the, the, the directors or the actors have. And it's interesting that Warner's did that without any real reference or seemingly any reference to their major talent. If you want your major talent to leave you, that's a great way of doing it. A bold move and perhaps something that's, uh, that's come from the ultimate owners of the business. I think you're absolutely right. That don't necessarily understand the, the symbiotic relationship that's been uh, developed over decades. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, and we'll also see how it affects HBO Max, which has had a bit of a slow start, I believe, in America. Let's see how it develops and keep our eyes on that story as it, uh, as it rolls through the year. And now it's time for my guests to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they want to tell to get in the bin. Come on, Jeff, who's your hero of the week? I'm actually still sticking a little bit with with Warner's, strangely enough. You'll we'll understand why, because I, this chap uh, who I'm going to sort of nominate as my hero is a man called Peter Roth. And I don't know how many people know who Peter Roth is uh, in terms of the UK. I think people who've gone to the LA screenings in May to see all the new pilots and uh, had that experience, will know Peter Roth. Peter is the sort of chairman and chief executive officer of Warner Brothers Television Studios, which is a, a wonderful title. And he's had it since 1989. And next year, he will be stepping down. So he's he's been there for a very long time. Peter started as, a, as an American you know, US TV producer. But the thing about him over his career or over his span where he's been at Warner Brothers that length of time, he's created or been part of that creation of either through development or producing or actually getting that show made, supporting the, the, the actual the producer who wants it, but getting it through into, the, into Warner Brothers studios. Some of the best shows that we've, we all, and we all know and love, things like, you know, 
ER, The Mentalist, West Wing, Friends, Without a Trace, Big Bang, Vampire Diaries, and has had 32 primetime scripted series that have reached over, that have gone to over 100 episodes. This chat is, is phenomenal. When we used to go to the LA screenings, when you went to Warner's for their uh, upfronts, as they used to call it, and, and their sort of presentation, Warner Brothers always used to say every year that the previous year they had been number one in this, number one in that. And Jeff Sessinger, who was the president of Warner Brothers, another great guy who's, who's uh, who stepped, uh, stepped down as well, he used to just revel in the fact that Warner Brothers had these all these number ones, all these plaudits, all these great things that they'd done. And it was all because Peter Roth's magic and the way he could find these shows or bring people on uh, and bring producers in. Because him going, I think, is a real, is a real, is, a, is really, really quite sad in terms of how he was able to influence modern culture in terms of all these wonderful shows that he made. I mean, obviously, particularly for the American market, but also for us over here. And um, some of these shows, like British shows, like British shows that produced, you know, really do mean something to people, or they they start them off in a direction of what they want to do in their in their career and you know how they do stuff i mean when i was nine i watched colombo and thought i want to buy shows for the british market that's because i saw it on telly and i thought that's the job i wanted to do and then i did it so these shows are really interesting if if any of it's er people might say i want to be a doctor I, I, I want to be a nurse or whatever it is i think they are amazing pieces of drama and this man has been responsible for some of the best and i think it's uh He's my hero because he's. It was only announced the other week that he was stepping down, and I think he's certainly one of the top guys of, of American television over the last thirty years. All right, and who are you going to tell to get in the bin? Well, I think this is an easy one, Justin. Apart from yourself, uh, right. obviously, because you know, you, I don't like you either. No, the, the thing I really want, and I'm sure somebody's done this. So if if they have, stop me. Well, actually, if they have, don't stop me because I'm I haven't got anything else. Don't say COVID. I'm not going to say COVID. No, I'm not. I was going to say COVID, but I changed my mind because I want to actually just put the whole of 2020 in. Can I do that? Yes. Can, can I say 2020? And I'll tell you why. Because 2020 has been back to this whole life on hold. Yes, that was COVID. But also, of course, we've got our lovely, our lovely Brexit that has helped us maintain the status quo uh, and, 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 and do absolutely bugger all in terms of, uh, of, of, our, of our lives and how people are getting on. We, we, everything is on hold, and, I, and I've hated 2020 for that. Mm. Everything has changed, as we've been sort of talking about, you know, in terms of you know, people don't go into work, that whole social thing, seeing people, touching people, which I know, you know, I know you, you're not supposed to do these days, um, but, it, it, but I think you know what I mean, uh, in terms of hugging people, hugging family, hugging friends, hugging friends and seeing friends and going for a drink with people and just – that social intercourse, that whole contact sport that you know that we we have of, of actually just being touchy, you know, touchy feely creatures, mm. and I think it's been awful for that, and and also because twenty twenty has been a shit year for people who I who have died as well, and, and not just in the terms of people in a, in that horrible ever growing sixty five thousand people who have died of COVID across the year, which is which is awful. But also I, people who have, I've worked with and friends who have died as well. And so, you know, in terms of 2020, it's that saying, you know, I just want it to be over so we can actually look forward to a better year and a happier year and hopefully not the disaster that it's it's been, really. Yeah, quite right. Well, that's a fitting note to end on jeff thank you let's put 2020 in the bin i think uh, a lot of us will agree with that let's hope we emerge blinking into the sunlight of 2021 when spring comes and we can look forward to better days so oh, you're such a romantic that's what's what they all say jeff thank you so <laughs> much for coming on really appreciated your time on the show this week have a great christmas and a great break hopefully we'll see you on the Quasset at some point in the near future. Well, Justin, thank you again. I've really enjoyed it. It's, it's the first time I've spoken to anybody else for about uh, eight months or so. <laughs> it's so thank you for that. And uh, I look forward also to being on the Quasset and uh, and visiting the the bars of said uh, room. All right. We'll see you there. Okay. Take care. Cheers all. And so for the last time in 2020, we're going over to Hollywood to speak to Peter White, 
from Deadline. Peter, how are you? Merry Christmas, as it nearly is. Hey, Justin. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, yeah, nice to, nice to speak to you. I, uh, I'll be honest, when you started doing this back at the start of the pandemic, I didn't think I'd still be uh, on your podcast in December. No, no. Well, that's it. That's one of the many surprises we've had this year you know I, I didn't know whether I'd still be doing it certainly didn't think I'd be entering into lockdown again for the second time and that's the same for you over in LA again you're under some strict lockdown restrictions again yeah it feels like the US and the UK are sort of trading uh, trading blowers in terms of who goes first uh, yeah we're uh, we're in under a stay-at-home order it doesn't really make any difference to sort of how we've been living the last last nine months or so, really. You know, some of the, the restaurants and bars are shut, but um, on the whole, it's uh, it's been pretty similar. I, I must say, you know, not to rub it in, the, uh, the sun is still shining. Yeah. Well, it says something for the year, uh, doesn't it? The fact that we're actually locked down and we're just, you know, accepting it as if it's kind of a usual sort of thing. The fact is we're all under almost house arrest. It is a very weird time. But spring is coming. Equinox is about to happen. It's going to start getting lighter. The vaccine's coming. I'm looking forward to uh, to getting a needle in my arm and so I can go back to uh, licking doorknobs soon. Yes, yes, exactly. As we're at the end of the year, I thought I'd ask you about, you know, what are your key stories of the year that you've seen covering the, the industry over in L.A.? This year, what are the five stories that you've uh, you've seen at Deadline, which you think have been the, the most uh, most interesting? Yeah, so I went back and uh, and crunched some data on terms of our uh, our site stats. Um, I'm going to preface this by saying these aren't necessarily the uh, the biggest stories. Uh, you can imagine we've written quite a lot about uh, Donald Trump this year. We've written a lot about COVID um, and a few other sort of weird stories that sit outside of that. So so these are sort of the the, the traditional TV stories, I guess. Um, that uh, have really uh, have really done the numbers for, for us. Um, the first one I thought was interesting in so much that it had talked to a wider trend is uh, is the reboot of Dexter. It was up there in terms of our biggest uh, biggest stories of the year. Michael C. Hall back to, to playing the, the serial killer, um, doing a, a, a reboot of the of the Showtime series. But I thought. What was even bigger than that was actually you look at, uh, at Hollywood now, and, and this is this is a trend that's been going on for a few months or a few years. Is just the reboot culture. Pretty much anything that lived on television or film um, in some form over the last you know fifty years is now uh, now being rebooted, uh, and I think that's something that's you know obviously going to going to continue. Even shows that you know weren't necessarily that big to to begin with. I'm not saying that about Dexter, but but a lot of things you know any bit of IP. Is incredibly valuable. It sort of it, it essentially means that you've got a, a jump start on marketing. You know, look, this year we've uh, we've seen announcements on shows like Gossip Girl coming back, uh, In Treatment. Uh, on the non-scripted side, you've got Who Do You Think You Are and Wipeout. Uh, there's a new Battlestar Galactica. Some details about the new Blood came out. There's talk of even you know True Detective and things like that. Pretty much anything that ever existed in uh, in the entertainment business seems to be on the uh, on the development list somewhere. Yeah, well, it's like sequel culture, isn't it? You know, it's TV's answer to sort of Toy Story 5 or or wherever we're up to now. But Dexter is interesting because that was, that's a decade after the the last season finished. Yeah, uh, yeah, 2013. If you remember, I, I uh, wasn't, I didn't follow the whole season, uh, the whole show, but uh, that final season was quite controversial. I think quite a few uh, Dexter fans were a little bit disappointed with how it ended. So it will be fascinating to see how they pick that up. Uh, Showtime said, you know, they've got a good idea. Clyde Phillips and, and Michael C. Hall have uh, uh, got an idea how to how to bring it back. But that's it. How do you how do you bring these shows back? And um, the, the one that I'm still waiting for, you know, crossing my fingers uh, at some point is uh, is The West Wing. Um, that's, you know, one of my favourite shows of all time. And, and uh, you know, whether that can come back. Aaron Sorkin has said uh, if they come up with an idea for it, then, then they might. So I'm still uh, holding out for that one. That would be fantastic. And we haven't seen the much vaunted Friends reunion, <laughs> have we yet? It was going to be some sort of get together, wasn't it? Yeah, it was going to be a reunion special. Essentially. It's funny, isn't it? Because that was going to be the big HBO Max uh, launch title that, that they didn't, uh, didn't end up making uh, yet. They will be um, you say that, I guarantee you there will be a Friends reboot at some point in the future, whether it's uh, next year is unlikely, but you know, you can very much imagine down the line that uh, that they will try and do that. 
Well, that's it. You can imagine Apple buying Netflix and that being the key titles in 2025. Quite. <laughs> What else have you seen this year that's uh, been interesting? So the cancellation of Live PD was also a, a big uh, big drive of traffic to, to Deadline this year. Uh, a quite a big show for A&E. It was their flagship show, really. It, you know, aired hundreds of hours uh, across uh, across the network. What was really interesting about that was, you know, the timing of it come about, if you remember, you know, it was, it was essentially pulled in the wake of, of George Floyd's murder. And, you know, it wasn't directly tied, obviously, but, you know, the, the police and, and how that is portrayed on television is, is a subject that's really in the in the spotlight at the moment. You know, there was a bit of controversy around that. There was a, a Javier Ambler was uh, was someone on. They'd been filmed on the show and, and the videos had been destroyed, but, you know, it was captured by the, the crew. There was a bit of controversy about that. Cops was also pulled. Television essentially reassessed how it, uh, how it portrayed police on television in the wake of, uh, of Mr. Floyd's death. So I thought that was really interesting. You know, there's talk that they're going to try and bring it back in, in some form or how they do that. But, you know, what we'll see on the scripted side as well, and we're, we're starting to hear this, is a lot of these shows are, uh, are trying to, to deal with how they how they portray the police on, on television, because it's not quite as simple as it was, uh, you know, this time last year. Things are obviously seem to have polarised in lots of different directions in the US over this last uh, election cycle. So, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see what a lasting impact that has on on entertainment decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you look, talking on entertainment decisions, we broke uh, a big story back in October. Uh, another cancellation story, a uh, doom and gloom, uh, it seems, for me, but there's uh, more positive to come, I promise. Glow was, uh, was cancelled, but it wasn't just so much that it was cancelled. It was that, you know, it, it, essentially the decision on its renewal had been reversed because of COVID. They had been renewed for another season and... Uh, and because of the, the coronavirus, uh, it sort of became a casualty, essentially. Um, you know, a lot of fans were, were upset at that. You know, it wasn't going to return for its, its fourth and final season. And I think that was, you know, there was a few more in, in the wake of that. There was a few other shows that came out of that. You know, On Becoming a God in Central Florida, which was the Kirsten Dunst series from Showtime, which I, I really enjoyed. Uh, Stump Town, which was an ABC show. All of these shows that... Um, essentially, the the networks had blamed on on COVID uh, hitting them. So that was something, you know, in the wake of uh, the pandemic, we saw saw a bit of that. Um, and it also, you know, Netflix cancelling shows. Netflix has sort of uh, been given a little bit of a, a free pass um, compared to some of the other networks when they when they cancel things. And I think this one hit quite big. Mm. And it was more like an abandonment, that wasn't it, as opposed to a cancellation. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure the creators felt like that. Yeah, their, their statement was, uh, you know, was was quite telling. You know, it opened by saying, you know, COVID killed actual humans. It's a national tragedy, but uh, but it also took down our show. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, it, in, in in the light of it, uh, it, it, it might have felt like that. Okay, and uh, what else? What else did you uh, have you seen? Two more positive ones uh, to leave you with the top stories. Um, do you remember Tiger King? Um, I mean, it feels like a long time ago that we were we were all talking about uh, Joe Exotic, but uh, it came out, didn't it? Right at the at, at that moment where we were, you know, locked in, everything, everyone was was inside. We weren't seeing friends, and it, it was a, a huge hit. You know, Netflix has said one of its biggest uh, biggest documentary series. Um, but what will be really interesting to see next year is, is you know, what's next, essentially. Um, there's two big scripted series based on Joe Exotic, based on Tiger King. Uh, Nick Cage is in one of them. That's, uh, that's one that's going to be in, uh, well, it's in development at Amazon. You know, he's not really done TV before, so and, and he's a he's a fascinating character. And then Kate McKinnon, uh, the SNL star, is is in another one. Um, this one's NBC Universal, Peacock, and so forth. But uh, she's going to play Carol Baskin. Whether they both make it to air, I don't know. But it, uh, you know, we might not have seen the last of of Joe yeah. And Nicholas Cage, he was uh, there's there's also rumored to be developing some kind of swearing show, isn't it? I did I read somewhere? Yeah, yeah, it's coming to Netflix in January. History of swear words, which will will be his first uh, first TV show. It's a bit of a comedy. It's a bit of a, a short form. I say short form, not quite a quibby, but shorter episodes. Sort of fun, you know. I think the release might have said it, it was docu comedy. He's sort of sitting there by a fireplace <laughs> uh, talking about so, yeah, where history of swear words. So no, look, uh, it might be Nick Cage's year next year. He's um, he's a, a, a slightly odd chap, isn't he? 
look forward to that. I love love uh, love a bit of Nick Cage, but uh, he's been away for a while, so I'll be welcoming him back with open arms into TV. And how about next year, Pete? Uh, in terms of looking towards twenty twenty one. I mean, what do you see developing with, you know, the sort of key developments in US TV over the next year? It's interesting you say, uh, we sort of already know, really, given how long scripted takes uh, to make it to, to screen, what might be next year and even into, into 2022. It certainly has felt during the pandemic that development uh, has kept going. And, and we've written more and more stories about, uh, you know, projects and, and so forth. There's obviously more and more platforms. So we sort of have a, a bit of an idea. I think the big shows, and, and these aren't necessarily developments, these are things that are, are being produced and so forth. I think Lord of the Rings is going to be a huge one. I really think that might be be a, a standout moment for, for Amazon. Um, you know, they obviously have to get it right. And, and I think a lot of those fans will be paying close attention to that. But I think that might be the big Amazon show if if they do get it right. That's um, you know they've uh, now installed the casting for that. Um, it's got a two season order. Um, you know, not don't necessarily know all of the details. We sort of know uh, Robert Arameo is is playing uh, Beldor, who's thought to be the, the lead. Um, but I think that's going to be a, a very big one for for twenty twenty one. In that vein, I mean, there was a Disney presentation. Last week, four-hour presentation. Yeah, it's amazing. There was amazing. The the announcements were just. I mean, it was it was literally like a content arms race. I mean, it was extraordinary what they what they came out with. The number of movies and TV series across all of their huge brands was was stunning. We had a, a team of eight journalists covering that, and we all all you know exhausted by the number of stories we wrote. And and from the TV side, and in that sort of fantasy space, you know, across they you know announced Star Wars and Marvel, you're going to have around ten TV series each. So, you know, from Marvel, you've got Loki, WandaVision, Falcon and, and Winter Soldier and, and, and more. Um, Star Wars, you've got an Obi-Wan Kenobi show. You've got a Lando Calrissian show and or. So, yeah, they kept coming. And I, I don't necessarily think we'll see. We might see one or two of them in, in 2021. Um, but, you know, this is this is obviously a pipeline similar to how uh, Disney does its movies with uh, quite a long lead time. So I think, you know, the fantasy genre, the superheroes, the um, anything in that uh, sci-fi world, I think that's, you know, continuing uh, to, to be big. And, and similarly on that note, it probably is more like 2022, but, you know, a Game of Thrones uh, prequel. You've got, you've got House of the Dragon coming. Um, mm. They started casting on that. Petty Constantine, uh, Matt Smith, Olivia Cook, they're, they're all going to be in that one, which... Uh, Apparently, it's three hundred years before uh, before the events of Game of Thrones. So, you know, add that to to the list, and and I think sci fi fans or certainly fans of, of genre are going to be uh, pretty well stocked for, for the foreseeable future. One that I well, there's a couple a couple I hear more to 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 tell you about. I, I I really like the look of Mr. Mayo. It's coming up in January. It's a network show, and it's for NBC. It's got Ted Danson in it and Holly Hunter. But it sort of feels like it might be in that 30 watt vein. And I think what certainly network television is, is crying out for is something that, uh, that people, um, you know, that, that has it catches a bit of, of the zeitgeist. You know, American broadcast network comedies tend to, tend to be very multicam and, and, a, and a, bit, uh, a bit safe. So uh, Mr. Mayer uh, does feel like it, it's in that sort of Parks and Rec, 30 Rock, maybe the uh, Steve Carell's version of The Office. So hopefully, uh, Hopefully that will do well. Uh, Shonda Rhimes, she's got what sort of appears to be her first sort of quote-unquote premium show uh, through her Netflix deal called Inventing Anna, which is uh, uh, basically a story about a grifter or a fake heiress, uh, Anna Delvey. Um, Julia Garner from Ozark is going to play um, play the, the scammer. But, um, you know, obviously Shonda Rhimes is best known for for the sort of ABC soapy shows, Grey's Anatomy and, and the like. And she's got Bridgerton, which is a, a period drama. But, um, yeah, I think this might be one that, uh, you know, gets a bit of buzz. Uh, that's probably coming in in 2021. So uh, so there's all that. And then I can't leave you without without my favourite, uh, something I grew up on, which, uh, talking of reboots, is uh, a new version of Beavis and Butthead. Ah. Uh, so, you know, look, we could... Uh, you and I probably do quite good impressions. Of, oh, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, th- this is this is the big reboot that I've been waiting for. 
<laughs> well, now I, the, the thing I really want to know, and they haven't really given too many details, is, uh, you know, obviously Beavers and Butthead for me was it was about the characters, but it was also about the, the videos. Wasn't yeah. It? It, was all, it was about, you know, them them talking about the latest Metallica or Slayer or Nirvana um, video. So uh, I'd be curious to see how they do that and whether uh, whether we get some head banging out of it. Yeah, well, I, I hope so. I mean, music TV, I mean, it kind of still does exist, but, you know, it's all about YouTube, isn't it? It's all about social media and, and bands, you know, really releasing their uh, their videos on social media. So I'm sure there'll be lots of nods to that, but I can't wait for that. And that's obviously going to be coming out on... Uh, well, MTV, essentially. Whether it actually airs on MTV, the, the channel, or one of one of the streaming services within that uh, is, isn't quite clear. But uh, yeah, you can imagine it's within the Viacom CBS world. Uh, what is it? Paramount Plus is, uh, is their streaming service that they're rebranding to, to next year. So yeah, we'll see some uh, hopefully Cornelio and uh, and the gang uh, back next year. Yeah, well, I, I actually have to admit, I mean, I've been googling recently. You know, Beavis and Bowie. Where where do you see? Where do I see it? But it's it's not. It's it's uh, certainly I couldn't find it anywhere. That is a, a reboot that's uh, that's music to my ears. So we've got Amazon, we've got HBO, uh, we've got I think it's NBC. Uh, we've got Viacom, and you mentioned Netflix as well with the with the Shonda Rhimes. So it's uh, it's going to be a pretty big year, isn't it, for TV? Certainly, certainly, as you say, some of these may may move into uh, 2022 with some of the Disney ones you, you you mentioned. But you know, it's uh, all of this development is has also been bottled up as well. You'd imagine so. There's going to be lots of lots of commissions to talk about, presumably in uh, in 2021. It will be, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, uh, there's, as I said, there's been a, a huge amount of development, whether that turns into series orders. I think the, the biggest thing now is whether these things can all uh, all get shooting. Certainly over here in LA, things are, are shooting, but a lot of them are shutting down for a couple of weeks here and there. Next year, we'll see, you know, there might even be quite a bit of a bottleneck, really. I think that might be be an issue for, for many of the broadcasters. Scheduling, uh, you know, we've already seen one or two cases where people have had to pull out of projects because, you know, they were meant to be shooting it over the summer or, or, or such and such. So, yeah, there'll be a lot of telly. Uh, uh, that's one thing that I don't think people have to, to worry about. Invest in a studio. You know, the studios are, are already uh, bursting to capacity, I, I, I gather, and they can't build them quickly enough in the UK. So, uh so that's, that's that's probably somewhere to invest your money. The television adaptation of Telecast, Justin, uh, given, uh, given what's going on in the podcast world. So uh, so hopefully you'll be announcing that soon. Yeah, well, absolutely. And uh, who do you want to play you, Pete? Uh, no comment. Yeah, OK. Well, I'll leave that with the listeners to uh, to maybe see, make some suggestions. But Peter, it's been brilliant speaking to you all, all throughout this year and, and the crazy ups and downs mainly downs, really, uh, of the pandemic. But, uh, you know, it's been fascinating for you to to be reporting back and covering what's happening in uh, in LA and obviously the TV's biggest market in the world. So it's, it's been really interesting. And uh, we look forward to more of the same in 2021. Always happy to chat. So once again, for the last time in 2020, we're going over to Riga to speak with Gertz Lises, from K7 Media. How are you, Gertz? How are the frozen wastes of Riga right now? Hi, Justin. Hi, everyone. We are having the dark, darkest day today. It's somehow with a with a nature that uh, they said that evenings are going to start becoming lighter by some seconds already tomorrow, but mornings are still going to get darker. That doesn't make sense to me, Gertz. That's, that's, that sounds far too complicated. No, it's quite complicated, but People will still watch <laughs> telly. I think we're going towards the winter equinox in the UK, and it's the same for everywhere in Europe. Anyway, well, welcome to the show, as always, Gertz. What are we going to be talking about this week? Today, I'm going to look at some of the strategies which are helping the local players to stand their ground against global streamers. And I thought it would be particularly interesting to review this um, in light of announcements of the three major British broadcasters, first ITV, then Channel 4, and finally from BBC last week, just within a month or so. Each of them coming up with different strategies with pretty much uh, one goal, to establish their online video services at the core of their future product offering, finally. 
Yeah, it's about time, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely about time. And on the other hand, to be fair, just a little more than a year ago, analyzing the ambitions behind strategies of global companies, some which already had made their move, others at that time just planning to enter the online video space, even most of those saw the streaming services as secondary to their core business. For instance, bundlers like Amazon or Apple see video as a tool to deliver as much premium viewing as possible. AT&T wants to deliver and own as much premium viewing as possible. Premium networks like Stars or Showtime see it as a way to earn incremental role in viewers' video diets, while such incrementalists as NBC Universal and AMC were looking forward to growing their share of viewers' video time and building direct-to-consumer relationships. Interestingly, Disney was the only company openly stating that online video was going to become the new core of the Walt Disney Company. And I think the results we are seeing now, just a year after the launch of Disney Plus, show the importance of setting a clear direction. Incredibly important for them as well as their cruise liners and their theme parks have been shuttered. It's more important than ever for them, but it's a remarkable success. Yeah, absolutely. So back to the weaponry, what the local players have at their hands. With a good old SWOT analysis in mind, where do the strengths and opportunities of locals lie? In knowing well their own markets and audiences, having an established customer base, that infrastructure, and using those in their advantage. But there is one more very important factor, and that is speed of action. That's where I think many locals have failed so far, possibly by underestimating the global competition. Meaning decisions have been too slow and coming too late? I can share my own experience. Since I happened to work at the Swedish MPG group at the time, when as early as in 2012, the company appointed a specific member of staff, a project manager, researcher, who was sent on a fixed-term mission to LA with a single goal, to gather a full picture of what was brewing in the US in terms of streaming, infiltrating, researching, gathering information, and reporting it back to the HQ on a regular basis, thus making sure that the company's strategies had a solid ground for making some timely, and at that time, quite unpopular decisions. For instance, already in, I think it was 2015, when MTG's SVOD service Viaplay launched the production of its first original drama projects, which many may have thought was a suicidal move. And over the time, Viaplay has increased this output of originals to approximately already 40 titles per year. And as a result, it has not only remained the second most popular VOD platform in the Nordic region with constant growth of its client base, but it's currently actually the Europe-originated VOD service with the most subscribers and is now even gearing up for extensive international expansion, not only across Europe, but also to U.S., if we are talking about traditional broadcasting, in many markets we see redirecting the resources towards the local productions. And this is particularly apparent among networks which are running a portfolio of multiple channels. Their flagship channels are increasingly becoming acquisitions free, with foreign programming pushed out of prime time into late night and daytime slots, while the foreign programming is still providing a strong and reliant source for their secondary channels. But with streaming services gradually expanding their genre horizons, I think that event television remains one of the strongest fortresses in the offering of linear channels. Exclusive live shows as well as non-live recorded shows with event feel, those which contain unmissable moments, shows which are particularly fun watching together with family, with friends, and which are triggering a debate, the talk of the town. This is still one area where traditional broadcasting prevails. Various surveys show that in many territories, co-viewing as an experience is much more popular on linear TV than streaming. Even more so, this difference increases with the growing size of co-viewing groups. For instance, in UK, 34% of viewers acknowledge that they have been watching shows on streaming services together with one other person, while the same experience has been confirmed by 48% of viewers of linear TV. However, almost twice as many viewers are likely to watch programming together on linear TV in groups of three or more people than watching together shows on streaming services, which interestingly tend to be much more of an individual experience. That's backed up by I'm a Celebrity, which is ITV's biggest show of 2020 an average of 11 million viewers watching across a series, which is still pretty impressive. So viewers prefer building alliances 
on a living room sofa watching telly. But what about broadcaster alliances in, in fighting these global invaders, these global digital invaders? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, because another common strategy local broadcasters have been using is creating these alliances of scale. Here we can talk about different aspects of the business, from the joint commissioning of programming to the launch of collaborative distribution platforms. For instance, one commissioning example is an initiative called Nordic 12. I'm again talking about Nordics. This is an alliance of broadcasters of the five Nordic countries triggered by the need of having a bigger volume of quality Nordic drama throughout the year. And the commissioners were also not very happy that they they would not know in advance if uh, the partners would join in a co-production or not. They needed earlier commitment to lift the projects. And most importantly, they would be frustrated about the short licensing period, making high-end product available for only one month on their digital broadcasters, catch-up platforms after the closing episode uh, on uh, linear TV. And as a result, Nordic 12 was established, and now 12 Nordic projects are commissioned annually, three from Sweden, Denmark, and Norway each, and uh, two from Finland and one from Iceland. They're co-financed by the podcasters of the five countries and made available for 12 months without restrictions to all five participating broadcasters, with each network retaining exclusive domestic linear and also digital rights. There is no joint commissioning panel. The genres and content are, of course, discussed, but all decisions are made in each territory locally, with everybody else accepting each local head of drama's curated choice. I've often wondered how that worked, actually. And this is a, has to be an enormous trust between those broadcasters in each other. It's a democracy <laughs> as well. On distribution front, obviously, we increasingly see platforms scaled up as language um, or regional bubbles, like the same Britbox focusing on British content or salt on the French content, for instance. And then another way to scale up, particularly when it comes to high and big budget productions, is, of course, making frenemies, that is, forming partnerships with third parties, which would in classic terms, so to speak, be regarded as fierce competition and therefore considered impossible to collaborate with per se. At some point pre-COVID, up to 56% of European Netflix and Amazon original shows, including countries like UK, Spain, Denmark and the Netherlands, were co-produced with local broadcasters. And in such co-production models, streaming platforms typically get rest of the world rights in exchange for partial funding. But the question is whether broadcasters are getting a good deal from these arrangements. It's not a secret that broadcasters are usually bearing uh, the majority of the costs, up to 75% of the total budget. And another risk for broadcasters to be considered when using the strategy is that channeling their audiences to the streaming platforms, they may be cannibalizing their own viewing figures, particularly among older and more conservative viewers who can start changing their habits too. And how about production? Is uh, production talent feeling comfortable changing their habits too? When it comes to production, one golden coin many broadcasters are still holding is the financial terms with producers and talent. While the expectations of producers may differ, of course, many are used to generous participation in back-end, particularly in long-established creativity exporting markets. Many streamers, on the other hand, are pushing for rights buyout from creators instead. Therefore, the fact that streamers are looking to hold on to IP can prove a key trump card for uh, traditional broadcasters who allow producers more generous rights deals. In uh, the UK, for example, Channel 4 recently agreed a new rights deal with producers with a broadcaster relinquishing its share of secondary international revenues in return for greater freedom to exploit programs across its platforms in the UK. We're seeing that as well, aren't we, in uh, in the US at the moment with HBO Max and, and a lot of Hollywood getting pretty upset about what HBO Max is doing right now in terms of uh, all the Warner product that's going to go next year. And, and obviously, talent and the, all the back end is going to be disappearing for everybody, all the talent uh, involved in those shows, presumably. That's a good point. Well, and then finally, in many major markets, uh, the legislators are trying to establish a fairer playing field, which should see the global tied to the same rules that apply to the local players. We see such initiatives in making from Australia to South Africa to Canada, 
and of course also in the EU, where according to the legislation, 30% of a platform's content has to be European. However, EU's directives are not legally binding. Each EU nation must individually interpret these guidelines in its own laws. So in France, for instance, According to the new law from January of the next year, the SVOD platforms will have to join other broadcasters in having to spend 25% of their turnover in France on European productions, with a large yet-to-be-determined proportion of that going towards French productions in particular. Uh, But what the skeptics of such formal rulings say, though, is that there are certain risks. One risk is that the quotas would be achieved by just downsizing the catalogs, which uh, would obviously hurt consumers by taking away choice from them. Or that the new rules could also further inflate production costs with broadcasters and streaming platforms spending lavish sums on top talent just to meet these quotas. Do we expect to see those sort of quotas coming in in other territories across Europe and around the world, do you think, in the coming months and years? Yeah, there definitely, like like I said, there is this uh, kind of umbrella ruling in EU. And uh, so definitely other European countries like Germany or Italy are also looking into this. And and probably I think we can expect it also in, in, in other places. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the UK as well. Obviously, now yeah. the UK finally will be uh, leaving the European Union, we think, with some sort of deal or or not. Who knows? Gertz, thank you so much for coming on the show today and all your other appearances in 2020. I've really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you so much. Wrap up warm and uh, look forward to the daylight when it finally reappears. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I must say, it's been super exciting to be part of this journey with you as well so far. And uh, obviously, it's been a tough year for many of us. But like I I have been stressing many times here, it's important to see through the opportunities, even when the times are tough. And that's something I think I wish all the telecast listeners in the new year as well to find their silver lining and capitalize on that. Absolutely. I'll always know you as the eternal optimist. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, take care. Have a fantastic Christmas. Thank you. And all the best for 2021. All the best. Bye-bye. And once again, it's time to welcome our well-being coach, Tracy Forsyth, to the show. How are you, Tracy? I'm very well, Justin. I'm looking forward to Christmas and uh, looking forward to that lovely Christmas dinner, sitting around eating chocolates, et cetera, et cetera. How about you? Same here. There's going to be a period of inactivity, I think, in my household. But yeah, just looking forward to turning off the emails a little bit and, you know, no more Zoom calls for a couple of weeks. Vegging out, really, I think. Yeah, so much needed relaxation, let's call it that. Self-care. Definitely. So what are we talking about on this, the last episode of Telecast this year? Because it was the uh, holiday season, I thought I would do my very own festive 12 days of Christmas well-being tips. Excellent. All right. So brilliant. So 12 days of well-being tips for the Christmas and holiday period. So my number one tip is to breathe. So we've done breathing many times before on my segments, but I just want you to take a deep breath this Christmas and sigh it all out. What a year we have had. So deep breaths in and sigh it all out. So breathe. My second tip is to pause. So you've talked about relaxation and and, and just sort of vegging out. Well, there is nothing wrong with that. So pause, just put press the pause button, just really sort of relax, put your feet up, that, more of that later, actually. But pause, pause, pause. Time for the whole world to stop a little bit, if you can. My third one is to process, process what has gone on. We've had all kinds of, of turmoil this year. We've had good and bad. And if you are still particularly stressed out, if you are stressed out by the, this, this the end of the year and what's going to happen next year, then my advice is just to really get in touch with yourself and process what you're feeling as if all those thoughts and anxieties are a knotted ball of threads. Just spend time this Christmas sort of just kind of trying to unravel those threads. And even if you can't sort them out straight away, just acknowledge what is going on inside. My fourth tip 
is to hydrate. I know it's very, very tempting to drink lots and lots at Christmas, mm. and I'm not going to say don't, but make sure you hydrate with something of the non-alcoholic variety as well. So hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. It makes you feel a lot better. My fifth point is to stretch, stretch it out. You know, when you wake up in the morning and you open your eyes, you can begin stretching. So give yourself a full body stretch in the morning before you've even got out of bed. You can twist from side to side in bed, just stretch it out. So and once you're up and dancing, figuratively speaking, or maybe not figuratively speaking, make sure you stretch it out throughout the day. And I know that when we're not at work, even though we might have closed down the laptop, there's a big, big temptation to spend loads and loads of time on our smartphone. So we will still probably be hunched over, hunched over those little smartphones. So whatever you do, if you're going to do that, and I will be doing that myself a little bit, make sure you stretch it out, stretch those shoulders, stretch those that neck, et cetera, et cetera. Don't forget to stretch. Number six is to move. Now, whichever way you like to, you can move it. If you if you like to dance, you can walk, you can run, you can cycle, you can swim, you can do yoga, whatever it is, just make sure you do some moving. Number seven brings me on neatly to this is nature. Get out there, get out, have a walk, look at the sky, hug a tree. People call it forest bathing now. I actually did. I've got a dog, so I walk my dog every day. But the other day, I did actually hug a tree, and it actually looked good. It was an enormous tree. I thought, I'm just going to do it. My arms couldn't fit all the way around it. I gazed up at it and thought, wow, this tree's been here much, much longer than me, and will probably be here much after I've gone. But hug a tree. Nature is really, really nourishing. And no matter what the weather, remember what they say, you know, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothes. Hopefully we've got some sunshine. Number eight was hug a tree. And number nine is sunshine. Get your vitamin D. Now, hopefully we will have some winter sun. Winter sun is just some of the most um, the beautiful sun. I think it's like really sparkling sun. Now, listen, today, uh, when I look out the window today, it's really cloudy, et cetera, et cetera. But this morning, the sun was there. So I always make it a point that if there is any sun throughout the day in these winter dark days, I do what I can to rearrange my schedule just so that I can get out there in the sunshine and feel it on my face. Number 10. Now, I want you to celebrate. You might not feel like celebrating after the year we've had, but what I do want you to do is celebrate what's gone right. Even if out of 100 things that have gone wrong, if there's only one or two things that have gone right, remember just to celebrate those and just celebrate your resilience for having got through this year Celebrate the fact that you're still standing. Whatever it is, just celebrate. And no matter how tiny it is, I want you to celebrate what's gone right. Number 11 is compassion. Compassion, compassion, compassion. So compassion not only for yourself, but compassion for other people. So we're all maybe going to be cooped up with our families. And some of us are going to think that's a lovely thing. And then sometimes tempers may fray and um, arguments may happen. But now I think my my top tip there is to, to show compassion, show compassion for what the other person may be experiencing, count to 10 if you have to, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and also show compassion for yourself. My last tip, my 12th tip is to put your feet up. Now, putting your feet up is a time honored way of relaxing, but there is method to the madness of putting your feet up. It's not just because you're horizontal, but actually being in that in that position with your feet above your head is deeply, deeply relaxing. It helps your body slow down. It helps your circulation. If you've been standing or sitting all this year, then it kind of reverses that. Inverting the legs has been has always been known as a, a treatment for reducing swollen feet and, and legs. Number 12 is to put your feet up. And on that note, I, I wish you a lovely, lovely holiday period. Look after yourselves and I will see you or I will speak to you in the new year.
That's fantastic, Tracy. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And I think there's some uh, great tips there for everybody, all of them. And who, who can argue with any of those? And I, I particularly like the tree hugging. And I read, I think, that they've found that trees can actually communicate with each other. Ooh, yes, exactly. So they might, you know what, they might appreciate a hug and then they can say to the next tree, this crazy human keeps hugging me. <laughs> yeah. It does feel good. It does feel good. Hug a tree. Yeah, fantastic. Tracy, thank you so much. Again, have a great holiday period yourself. We look forward to having you on the show again in the new year. Relax, have a great break, and we'll see you in January. Thank you, Justin. You too. Well, that's about it for the last show of 2020. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. We've started a new free newsletter called Telecast Plus. We aim to make it the most useful thing coming into your inbox every Friday. It'll be packed with interesting TV industry stories of the week you may have missed, jobs news, execs available for hire, Tracy's tip of the week, and more insight and opinion you can shake a stick at. And it's all completely free. Just visit our website to sign up at www.telecast-podcast.com. Dot com. That's telecast-podcast.com. And there's a link in the description of the podcast as well. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers. Our next show comes out on Thursday, 7th of January. But if you can't wait that long, why not have a delve back through our previous 38 shows to catch up on any you may have missed? So it just remains for me to say have a fantastic Christmas and a very happy new year. It's a great chance to reflect, refresh, and get ready for 2021, which I'm sure is going to be another exciting year of huge change in the TV world. And it won't be long until we all meet up together again in person and remind ourselves why we're so lucky to work in this fantastic, creative, and fast-moving industry. So, until then, a very Merry Christmas. Stay safe and see you on the other side. <laughs>